For those of you expecting my log build video today, sorry, that's coming out next Friday. It's not quite finished yet. But in the meantime, I've got what I think will hopefully be quite an interesting video today. I've got to put a new TV, this one's knackered, up on this slightly problematic plasterboard wall. And even if you don't have a TV to put up, hopefully you'll still find today's video interesting because I'm gonna be dealing with a load of issues that tend to crop up in DIY. For example, stud detection, hole cutting with multi-tools, impact drivers compared with hammer drills, the benefit of hole source, making your own ethernet cables and filling screw holes. And finally, I fully expected to have to anchor my TV with some really strong plasterboard fixings. In the end, I had the luxury of being able to add some stud work to screw into your best option. But if you're coming to this video today for a decent plasterboard fixings option, check out my recent full run through of all the best plasterboard fixings available on the market, a link to which is coming up on screen now. So I started this off with a very rough plan. So this is the old telly that's going. This is the new telly that's replacing it. It's a Samsung BU8000, um, 50 inch. Quite exciting for us. We've never had anything this big before. I'm no expert on LED TVs, but this is one of Samsung's entry level models. I was trying to find something as cheap as possible in this size. And I'm putting it up as low as I possibly can on this fireplace. Now we're hoping to demolish this fireplace sometime in the new year. There will be a video on that at that point. So I don't really care too much about what happens with it. But the weird thing about it is it's got an arch here that was there when we moved into the house and we got some builders to plasterboard in that arch. Not particularly well as it turns out because you see here there's a crack going all the way around. So I don't know how well the builders supported this plasterboard inside of the fireplace and we're going to find out in a minute by cutting a hole underneath. So the plan is to cut a nice big hole um, in the underside here so we can see exactly what's going on up there and it might provide us with quite an interesting space to hide some of the electrics. Now some of you will know I've fitted a lot of curtains and blinds in the past in our old business and one of the things you try and do is work out where the um, logins or uh, beams are behind plasterboard and you can do that with a simple tap test like that. So it sounds like there's something there in the middle that I may or may not want to try and avoid. Another way you can validate that is with uh, one of these metal detectors. Now they do stud detectors as well. I found them pretty unreliable in the past, but this particular one is a PMD7, discontinued now by Bosch. I think the Truvo is the replacement. I find this about as reliable as you're ever gonna get with one of these detectors. So I'm gonna put this up here and try and find a nail or screw in the stud work above. So there's definitely something there. So I'm gonna mark that, which is actually coinciding exactly with the pencil line I've made in the middle. So I think I'm gonna do my observation panel just hopefully missing this baton behind the plasterboard. And there appears to be another one just here, as you would expect. Now the other option, which is possibly cheaper than getting a uh, stud detector or metal detector, is to get a very strong magnet like this. I'll put details of where you can get this and everything else in the description below the vid. And you can hover that around the ceiling until it hits the screw beneath. So I'm going to take out a section, 100 million from the edge, To excavate, I'm using my old Ryobi multi-tool and I'm going to put a brand new blade on it just to make my life as easy as possible. Goggles, ear defenders. Holding the tube of my Henry vacuum right up against the cut allowed me to collect pretty much all the dust generated by the cutting process. On two sides of the cut I hit something above the plasterboard suggesting I was midway through a stud here, with the blade slipping right through into the void on the other two, suggesting either no stud work at these points or perhaps a blade was going in between the stud and the wall. Alright, got a painter's knife, I'm going to try and lever this out. I don't know what is holding it in at the moment. Happy days, look at that! And here were those two drywall screws we picked up with that metal detector. I had a lot to complain about on this build back in 2010 when I moved into this house, but to give the uh, carpenters their due, 
they've actually done a really good job of supporting this fireplace. Come and have a look. Filled in arch was basically supported with 4 by 2 inch stud work, some would say over engineered, and this suggests that the cracking around the front was more because the plasterers didn't use scrim tape around the arch. So I needed a plan for fixing the TV bracket to the wall. Now with any luck I can reuse this wall mount to see if it fits. And a bit of good fortune, I had kept the box the bracket came in, which had a load of different sizes of bolts and spaces for fixing the brackets to different TVs. I knew from sticking my phone up into the void there was a 4x2 inch stud running the length of the bottom of the arch. And I want to put my, fix my screws right into the middle of it. My bottom screw holes are there and there, and my top ones want to be there and there, ideally. I decided to put some studs or patches, as they're often called, behind the plasterboard to take those two top fixings, which are taking the majority of the weight of the TV. And drilling those holes was an easy way to mark the position of the studs. So I want to bang this joist uh, into the vertical behind here so I can screw into it. But it's quite hard to bang a joist into position um, when it's flush. Uh, like this. So what I've decided I'm going to do is take the corners off to see if that makes it any easier. Just a little idea I got from when I was fitting the solar panel brackets in the summer. Which have a similar design allowing you to twist the bolt lugs to the vertical once located inside the aluminium rails. So I sanded the opposite edges on each stud which enabled me to tap each one into position. I've got a tiny little spirit level in here from which I can just about see what that beam is as level as it needs to be. A couple of screws, one screwed at an angle from the inside and one from below outside, and the two studs were fixed into position. Which left me with the easy job of attaching the wall bracket with these six by 70 millimeter screws. Now I'm using my impact driver here I hardly ever use this as you will have seen me talk about in previous videos. Now the thing about impact drivers is they have a hammer action which works radially is that? in a circular action which makes basically driving in screws so much easier. A lot of people say uh, surely that's just like putting a combi drill into hammer action mode. Well no it isn't because if you put a combi drill into hammer action mode the hammer action is wor working in and out basically in the line parallel with the drill bit. So you're not achieving the same effect putting a combi drill into hammer action. Whether you need one of these is a different matter. Uh, for jobs like this, it's quite useful, as you saw here driving in this screw. But to be honest with you, I hardly ever use it. Most of the time I use my light drill driver and how much battery we've got. I'm gonna show you now the difference screwing in one of these quite hefty screws with my drill driver. So you're having to press reasonably hard. But as you can see, it does the job just fine. And don't forget, this is only a 12 volt drill driver. Back to the impact again. And I'm gonna have to put my ear defenders back on for this, because of my tinnitus. That was admittedly so much easier. You don't have to put almost any pressure on the screw compared to with the drill driver, but I'm going to ask the question again, will you be using one of these often enough to justify the cost of buying it? I was nearly done and just needed to drill a couple of holes in the plasterboard for the cables to avoid that mess of cabling you saw at the start. I don't use this hole saw set that often, but it's an incredibly important thing to have in your toolbox for when you need it. And I also drilled a larger hole through the chimney breast with my 25mm SDS bit in the hope this would be wide enough to route all the cables back to the plug socket, set top box and ethernet sockets. Now one thing I did back in 2010 on the advice of a friend was route network cables from each room downstairs to a couple under the stairs where my modem was. They're all looking a bit dated now. And as I ran out of cash, I never at the time installed a network switch to patch the cables into. But this does mean I've got um, an ethernet socket on the other side of this chimney breast. And I wanted to create a short network cable to connect the TV to that ethernet socket rather than rely on the Wi-Fi connection. And I just wanted to show you how I tend to do this because I make all my ethernet cables myself and it's very easy to do and very satisfying. All you need is an RJ45 crimping tool, the RJ45 connectors, and in my case here, some old Cat5e cabling. 
and there's an industry standard on what order the color coding of the cable should be in at both ends of the cable. And you just have to make sure, as you can see here, that you untangle the cables, get them in the right order, and slide them into the RJ45 connector and then crimp them off using the tool. Now, the only complexity to this, which I only realized this morning when I was researching for this video, is that in this situation, with a straight through connection like I've done here, you've got the color coding in the same order at each end of the cable. But for some connections called crossover connections, for example, where you're connecting two computers together or two modems, you have to slightly change the order of the cabling so that the input at one end matches the output of the other device. Thought I'd just mention that because if I didn't, people will point it out to me after I've posted this video. Well, I asked the guys about this on my Discord forum this morning, and I'm grateful as ever for them pointing out that crossover is a rarity these days, with auto crossover part of the gigabit standard. Sam also pointed out that with pass-through connectors, the tool cuts some flush, making it a lot less fiddly to wire them up. But these components are cheap, and if you're doing a lot of networking at your home, it's incredibly useful to be able to make up your own cabling. So I was pretty much done and all that remained was to connect the HDMI, Ethernet and power leads to the back of the TV, thread the cabling into the newly drilled hole and hang the TV on the wall. I quite like this bracket. It obviously doesn't swing but I've built in a slight downward tilt with those spaces and longer bolts and also you can adjust the level with the two fixing screws on the top. With the cabling connected the TV setup was pretty straightforward. So this is a more permanent solution. I put a little nog in there just to support this section here but I'm going to be taking this out reasonably regularly and as I said it's not this whole chimney breast is going to be going early next year so for the time being a few drywall screws it's such a pain they make these with Phillips head makes so much more sense if they were posi drive like everything else pre-drill because the plasterboard is a bit brittle I'm quite near the edge and that's it, all done. So how do you prep a hole with a wall plug in for filling? So if you've got screw holes left behind like this, there's a few ways you can deal with them. First thing you can do is try and actually lever out the plug before filling the hole. And well, the way you want to do this is with a screw like this, you don't want to go in too far because you could risk pulling the plaster away when you lever the plug out. And this is always a risk anyway. You want a bit of wood or something to protect the wall when you get your claw hammer out. And then you want to just gently try and pull the plug in. Here you come. Now that's come out pretty well, hasn't it? Option number two, you get a screw that's much bigger than the screw you used, and you try and indent that plug into the wall a little bit. Which will work if your plug wasn't sent back the full depth. The benefit of that is you don't have to put quite as much filler in. And you need a screw that's much bigger because if you try and use a small screw like this, chances are it'll just push the screw into the plug like that one's doing. Now option three, if for whatever reason those two options weren't available, and I've done this quite a lot in the old fitting trade when we're making, when we're installing soft furnishings, is you get a razor blade and you simply score very quickly, preferably a reasonably sharp one, around the outside of the hole and you take off the front of the plug. Which I say sharp, this really isn't that sharp. And what you want to do is end up with no, none of the plug actually point, uh, sticking out from the surface. Obviously with this option, you do end up with more damage around the plug itself and therefore a little bit more of a hole to fill. So as it was the cleanest option for the fourth hole, I'm just going to bash the plug in a bit. So I would suggest to you, this would be your best option. Oh, he says, <laughs> pulling it out and doing that on the surface. So let's end with a quick chat about filling those holes where the TV bracket used to be. Now I always favor the filler that you have to mix with water. You've got this deck patch. Uh, I also use uh, Easy Fill is one of my favorite fillers because it has far superior performance to these fillers you get in a pot. Now this says it doesn't shrink, but we'll believe this when we see it, maybe it'll be okay with a small hole like that. And in terms of filling that hole, you either want to get yourself a continental filler knife. I absolutely rave about these. They're fantastic for jobs like this. Uh, I also use this little small tool, which is brilliant for, for mixing the filler in the first place, if you're going with a powder mix. So starting with a ready mix poly filler, it has a mousse-like texture.
this sort of has a consistency of expanding foam before it's set. I haven't used this for ages. I haven't used this particular polyfiller at all, but it's actually not a bad consistency. You're pushing it into the hole as much as possible. See as I'm doing here. And this will, you'll try and prevent shrinkage by doing this. You see with these continental filler knives just how easy it is to tool the filler. And you want to leave the filler very slightly raised from the surface so that you can sand it when it's set. And that is pretty good. Next up it was a deck patch which I quite like using because it contains marble dust that gives it a very smooth consistency. For small quantities like this I go against industry wisdom by adding water to the powder rather than the other way around as it gives you much more control over how much you're making. Adding powder to water and you can easily make too much and you want to end up with a nice smooth but reasonably firm mix like this. Then it was into the hole like the polyfiller, again leaving it slightly raised from the surface. When it comes to sanding I don't use a 3M rubber sanding block anymore like this. I tend to wrap a 180 grit sandpaper around a wooden block because you tend to get a much flatter end result when you've been when you sanded the filler. So that's it for today. I don't know what happened to that nice quick video I was going to do, but hopefully some of these DIY processes will be useful for you on your projects. As usual, details of everything I've spoken about today will be in the description below the video, which you can access on your smartphone or your computer in the usual way. As I said, next Friday or possibly Saturday, I'll be uploading my epic log store build video. So keep an eye out for that. And in the meantime, if you're new to my channel, it would be great to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here. And don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all my future uploads. Thanks for watching and see you soon.